Well, cities have taken from nature, particularly in the modern age, and cities now have taken so much they need to begin to give back in new ways that I would like to uh, address here briefly. So um, I'm starting with a drawing uh, that comes from uh, a German geographer called Heinrich von Thunen. Uh, uh, it was his concept was the isolated state, and it basically describes why cities used to be embedded in the hinterland uh, with market gardening and uh, milk production immediately on the edge of the city, then the firewood and t lumber production also close by because it's heavy, then various types of crop production re requiring less and less uh, nutrient inputs, uh, sewage and, and animal manure, and then finally right on the edge the rough grazing uh, that basically where animals uh, refertilize the land. And the studies that have shown that all over the world cities in one way or another, so, or human settlements, were embedded in landscapes in, 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 in ver varieties of, of this kind, in, in, in similar ways to, to what this uh, uh, diagram shows. Then comes the Industrial Revolution and everything changes, and we see the extraordinary transformation of cities themselves in terms of the, the energy use, the, the pollution that's generated. Here's a picture of uh, what used to be the uh, uh, Deepwater Horizon just three months ago, you know, the latest installment in energy supply technologies for our cities, incredible pipelines supplying these kind of urban systems. This is uh, uh, Atlanta, Georgia, incredible low density uh, sprawls that rely entirely on the supply of fossil fuels, and that is certainly not a sustainable or in, indeed a regenerative future. Uh, we have other impacts, and this is certainly the uh, key issue also in this discussion, and we've already heard about it briefly. Cities rely on global supplies, and that includes the uh, transformation of rainforests, destruction of rainforests into cattle ranches, into forest, uh, into, into farmland, uh, re re requiring enormous quantities of fossil fuel inputs. This type of American style or the Brazilian style farming system that you can find in Mato Grosso in Brazil uh, on very, very large acreages requires 10 to 20 times more energy than actually comes out in the calorific content of the food that is supplied. So just a quick summary of these points, you know, urbanization has <coughs> dramatically contributed to uh, the increase in human numbers, but the uh, urban populations uh, and urban consumption patterns went up f even further and faster than uh, hu uh, global human populations. And uh, a really critical issue that every year now we're burning at least a million years worth of fossil fuels, probably more like two million years. It took about 300 million years for the oil and coal and gas to accumulate in the Earth's crust. We're burning in around 300 years or so. But cities, and this is why the discussion on the future of cities is so important, cities are clustered on relatively small surface areas of just 3 or 4% of the world's land surface. But they use the bulk of resources and produce the bulk of the waste. So that's why, obviously, the discussion about the future of the planet is so closely linked to the discussion about the future of cities. So from Agropolis, uh, the image I showed you a moment ago, we have moved to Petropolis. And this is the, the way a city, including Bristol, functions today. Basically, you take resources from anywhere, never mind where, never mind the consequences, never mind the externalities, never mind the fuel costs. So uh, food production is just part of that story. Uh, global transport systems supply our cities in ways that uh, need to overcome rapidly if we are serious about having a future for this planet. So what does this mean in terms of urban practice, in terms of uh, policy and, and technology? Uh, this is the leaking of energy, uh, of, of heat from buildings. Infrared photography shows that wherever you look in our cities, we have massive losses of energy as a result of bad insulation. And so uh, this is the kind of solution in terms of insulation materials that's now being developed. This is a material called aerogel, and you can have insulation on just this sort of thickness compared with about 30 centimeters of rock wool or other types of insulation material and the rose uh, above the flame does not wilt because of it, it, it absorbs so much so much heat and does not give us uh, very much off. So this is certainly part of the uh, story of uh, energy sufficiency, not just energy efficiency, how we can transform existing buildings in our cities rather than just discussing new types of buildings that might be designed uh, in the coming years, built in the coming years. How can we transform our buildings uh, that already exist by utilizing new materials?
transport systems. On the left, uh, the enormous space that is taken up by, by cars. Uh, in the middle, uh, uh, the, you know, the same number of people in buses on the right-hand side, uh, the minimal amount of space that's taken up by people walking. Now, of course, we have distances to cover in our city, so we can't all rely on walking or, or indeed on buses necessarily, but certainly the question of how we change the transport systems to our, of our cities is an absolutely critical issue. The electric car, of course, comes uh, handy, uh, and we are seeing remarkable new uh, developments there and also in the technological breakthroughs that are coming uh, from the major car companies like Nissan is going to build this electric car in Sunderland uh, starting production next year. But a critical issue certainly is the enormous uh, per capita use of energy uh, in our cities, and you just have figures here for various parts of the world. And in Switzerland, they have a, a project in Baal and in Zurich and elsewhere called the uh, 2,000 watt household, 2,000 watt individual, how we can re reduce our energy use per capita to anything uh, like a quarter of what is currently the case in, in many parts of Europe. What, what are the practical means of doing that? It's a very interesting discussion. I can rec recommend you looking at uh, websites called 2000 Watt Society. And obviously, you don't have much time to go into that in further detail. But the really exciting breakthroughs, of course, are now taking place in terms of renewable energy technology for cities both within cities like here in Freiburg and southern Germany, where these buildings here are becoming net exporters of electricity uh, because of the combination of large roof surfaces, as well as the fact that their high levels of insulation uh, using aerogels and other insulation materials are designed into the building itself. But as I said, certainly the question is not only what do we do in terms of new architecture, but what do we do in terms of moving on uh, using uh, much less energy in existing buildings. Uh, energy supply from the periphery of our cities. Uh, in our study on 100% uh, renewable energy for cities, we looked, for example, at uh, Seville, which is now uh, surrounding itself with this ring of uh, uh, solar farms, uh, solar thermal systems that are supplying uh, now about 50% of the electricity consumed in, in, in the city itself. And that certainly has huge relevance for Europe's cities right, right across the continent. Uh, different technologies will be applicable in different parts of Europe. Uh, here, the uh, thin film solar technology employed on peri-urban uh, solar systems, such as here uh, in Germany, where uh, the feed-in tariffs that uh, I'm going to be talk about a little bit more in a minute, uh, have made it possible to have cost-effective investments in renewable energy systems, getting paybacks of no more than uh, 10 years or so. And uh, under Ed Miliband, now we had introduction of feed-in tariffs as well, so I just looked it up yesterday, in fact. For solar energy now, uh, companies like Solar Century are predicting about a 10-year payback for investing in uh, in renewable and solar systems, both for, uh, on, on existing buildings as well as on the on the uh, on the periphery of our cities. Um, another I I interesting issue is the fact that there's been a major discussion, particularly on the, in the U.S., on the surface areas required to produce one hectare of energy crops, and the fact is that uh, PV systems uh, applied on farms. Uh, and often, you know, you can do it in such a way that you don't actually seal the ground, but instead you can still carry on grazing animals uh, on uh, land covered in part with solar cells. Uh, the uh, energy output from uh, surface areas of land is much, much higher if you use PV uh, farms rather than biodiesel or bioethanol or other uh, uh, crop-based uh, energy production systems. China, major breakthroughs in uh, uh, solar s hot water technology for buildings here in a city called Desu, which will be hosting the fourth Solar Cities Conference in September. Uh, 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 China is regarded as a place of huge wastefulness of energy and the l largest CO2 producer on the planet now. But China is also has 20% of its buildings now utilizing solar hot water systems. So remarkable stuff going on in that country too. Or Taiwan, uh, we are about to have a new stadium here in Bristol. Why can it, be, can it not be covered like here in Taiwan with solar cells? That is certainly uh, what is being done across Europe increasingly, using large roof surfaces of, uh, of, of uh, sh sh you know, sheds, of uh, supermarkets even, if, if they continue to exist for the time being, or indeed of uh, stadia for solar energy production.